Now, scientists have discovered what could explain why some people seem to be immune to COVID infection. The UK COVID-19 Human Challenge Study was conducted in, a 36, in 36 healthy adult volunteers without previous history of having COVID. For more on this, I am joined by Dr. Marco Nikolic, as, who's the Principal Research Fellow in Respiratory Medicine at the University College London. He's also the lead on, in that study. The first author, co-author of the study is Dr. Kaylee Warlock, who is also a postdoctorate research fellow in molecular and cellular biology at the University College of London. Thank you to you both for joining us this afternoon on Daytime Update. I'm looking forward to this conversation because I'm actually one of those people that didn't get a COVID, touch wood. Um, so tell us a little bit about the background into the trial and if it took what, what it took to convince people to agree to being exposed to COVID. Yeah, great. Thank you, Massa, for uh, having us uh, on. We're delighted to be able to tell you a little bit about uh, our study. Um, so f first of all, uh, what I'd like to say is that this was really a very, very collaborative uh, uh, project. So I was just the co-lead uh, and actually the clinical uh, part of the study was established by, uh, by was established by Christopher Chu at Imperial in collaboration uh, with many other UK scientists, including the UK Vaccine Task Force, uh, which is part of the UK government. Uh, and essentially, um, we, uh, Kaylee and I, together uh, with um, uh, other people, um, Rick Lindeboom uh, from Sarah Teichman's group from the Sanger Institute, we focus specifically on analyzing nasal and blood samples using a cutting um, scientific method called single cell RNA sequencing, which looks at kind of this uh, gene expression on uh, of different cells um, at a kind of individual single cell level. And to be honest, um, when I first heard about healthy people exposing themselves to SARS-CoV-2, uh, I thought that is utterly crazy. Uh, this is probably why you've invited us uh, uh, on this program. Uh, because on the one hand, we are, you know, shutting down schools, we're avoiding social contacts with our loved ones, um, shutting down global economies, as we know, whereas on the other hand, we're deliberately infecting people. But actually, uh, I'd just like to reassure you that this has been really safely done with flu previously, and the COVID challenge was done in an extremely safe and, and controlled way. Um, so specifically, we used a low dose of the virus, only adults with no comorbidities uh, and at very low risk of severe disease were enrolled um, and volunteers um, were monitored in a kind of high containment quarantine unit uh, around the clock uh, with immediate access to medical care if required. And actually nobody suffered any long-lasting long uh, sympt symptoms. Uh, actually, uh, you know, some uh, experienced some very mild cold-like symptoms uh, and nobody developed uh, long COVID. Um, and specifically, nobody really needed convincing. There was obviously freedom of choice was ensured at all times. Mm. Um, and volunteers were fully in, informed about the study's purposes, procedures, risks and benefits, benefits, and of course, the right to withdraw at any time. And actually, 27,000 um, people registered their interest. And um, we felt um, a lot of people at the time wanted to contribute to our scientific understanding and I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank them. Um, we're incredibly grateful for all the brave clinicians and also the volunteers who took part, especially at a time when we knew very little about the disease. Yeah, that's a lot of people who are willing to expose themselves like that for signs. Uh, Dr. Warlock, let's talk about the findings and the three different groups of people. What makes the protective gene in particular more special? And just take us through those different three groups. Uh, yes, yeah. so um, uh, we, for the single cell part of our study, out, so overall there were 36 people enrolled um, and we took 16 uh, patients and volunteers and looked specifically at those. Um, and as Marcus said, we looked in the nose and we also looked in the blood um, and took very detailed sim time point sampling. So we took samples prior to exposure and then regular time points all the way through to 28 days. Um, and actually what we were really surprised to see is although uh, six of those sort of went on to get your more traditional mild forms of COVID, so where you have multiple tests testing positive, uh, three patients actually um, had sort of one single positive test and that was it. And then uh, seven actually never became um, positive at all. 
Um, so we called these our aborted patients. Um, and so this is kind of the first case where we've seen um, I and mean, actually be able to find these within a, a cohort outs because you can't see them when you're looking, you know, just in a general population. You don't know if someone's actually been exposed to the virus. So it's very cool that we can look at this and then look at what the differences are between these three groups. Um, and so we actually saw very distinct patterns between the body's response to being exposed to the virus between these three individual groups. Um, so for example, we are able to see sort of a new immune response um, upon exposure with a particular specialized cells within these three infection groups. Um, in those that just had the single sort of positive test, we saw this massive influx of immune cells very quickly on in the nose, which are likely sort of helping these individuals prevent the virus from catching and hold and, and developing further into an actual infection. Um, and we also then saw, as you pointed out, uh, very high levels of expression of this gene, which is called HLA-DQA2, um, in the individuals that didn't go on to uh, develop a full infection. Um, and so we saw this prior to infection and, and throughout infection. And so we kind of suggest that this might be a, a protective biomarker we can use to look for um, in sort of in the community, for example, to see who those might be, you know, have a little layer extra protection. Although I want to be clear that there's no no sort of means that this, you know, this doesn't replace vaccinations. You're not immune because you have this expression. It's just an interesting thing that we can kind of look at and maybe use to help sort of build additional therapies and, and treatments. But we need to study this further. So it's not a superpower. You're not immune still. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Let's talk more about this protective gene, the HLA DQA2 as well. Did you find, do you know if it's hereditary or is it just by draw of the luck? Um, so maybe I can take this one too. So um, it's not, so typical HLA genes, um, you have a type and certain people fall into certain ones. It's not one of those ones. Everyone should have this sort of gene. It's just within the individuals we saw that went on to so protect themselves against the virus, we saw higher levels of expression. And particularly this was in um, immune cells that are sort of called antigen presenting cells. And so these cells are sort of the scouts of the body um, and they go around, they, they find things that, you know, look unusual and shouldn't be there. They break them up, they capture them, they break them up, and then they normally they expose, uh, sort of take out a bit of the virus put it on themselves and sort of go show the other body, other cells in the body, you know, this is different, this is wrong, like you you need to go find it and sort of sort it out. So those those are the cells we saw this high expression in. But um, it's not, uh, these individuals have more level, higher levels of this. It's not like people have it or they don't. Uh, and we don't know if it's passed down or anything like that. Is it a family thing? Um. No, no. So we this isn't a particularly well studied gene. Um, so other people have found it being associated lower levels are associated with less severe forms of COVID. And there are other studies that have associated with other diseases, sorts of autoimmune diseases and diabetes. Um, but it's it's not we it's not a hereditary mm. gene. Sorry, it's, it's in um, the expression. We don't know how it varies over time. We've only obviously looked in this very specific time. Um, so more more studies are needed. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nikolik, as well, if we can talk about this, I mean, can this protective gene be cultivated for people who don't naturally have it? Yeah, I mean, it's a good a good question. So first of all, we just need to be aware that we've not we've just ob made the opposite observation. We have not really worked out uh, the mechanism. And um, so and so more work is really ne needed. So we don't know whether you can somehow induce expression of that uh, of that gene. Um, but uh, yeah, we we'll, we essentially need to do more work to uh, to find this out. Uh, but certainly, what we know is that uh, those who have high levels of this gene um, that could indicate uh, protection from severe disease, whereas uh, those who have low expression could indicate uh, that at, that those people are at a higher risk of severe disease. And from this study as well, what were your other main results, Dr. Nikolik? Yeah, uh, so, uh, I mean, Kaylee has already uh, pointed uh, uh, the mal out apart from uh, the, this protection gene HLA TQA2, we've also identified novel immune responses uh, in in COVID infections. So some some immune cells going uh, up and, uh, and and down. Um, we we identified a very quick quicker immune infiltration 
so accumulation of immune cells, which is much, much quicker in the in the in the uh, nose rather than um, uh, well in in the in the blood rather than in the nose. Um, and actually, uh, the interferon response was detected first also in the blood before the nasopharynx, which is a bit surprising, isn't it? Because we challenge it at the nose, in the nose, but you see a first uh, antiviral response uh, in the blood. So there must be a very quick response going uh, between uh, uh, blood and then systemically uh, between nose and then systemically in blood. Mm. And are these results applicable for global population? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, it's a very good point. There are some limitations, as with all, all, all those studies. You know, we, we publish, we make, uh, you know, publish scientific discoveries when we think it'd be useful for others to also kind of contribute and uh, and uh, work uh, on on the same questions. Um, specifically to your questions, we've only, you know, recruited young adults with no comorbidities and actually 14 out of the 16 we recruited for the single-cell RNA-seq uh, a part of the study were uh, Caucasian. Um, so, yeah, that is the limitation. So we don't know whether it, it might be different if we include um, uh, uh, other um, uh, non-Caucasians. Um, other limitations, just to be clear, is uh, also that we've only induced mild COVID. We've not, uh, you know, induced severe disease. So we have to be careful, um, you know, extrapolating our findings to uh, those who develop severe disease. Um, and we've also uh, used the original um, pre-alpha strain. So we've not uh, done the study with other variants of concerns such as um, uh, mm. Omicron. Yeah, so more work still needs to be done, but it's still a step in a, the right direction, wouldn't you say? I mean, h how will this help to yeah. develop new treatments in the future if we have are faced yeah. with another pandemic like this? Yeah, I mean, so we now really know how uh, uh, how uh, we react to a new virus at really unprecedented detail because we used a single-cell um, multiomic cutting-edge uh, technology to look at uh, at all the different cell types in the nose and blood, how they, they respond to a viral challenge from pre-infection and then in regular intervals afterwards. Um, and we can actually use this information to compare our data to other data we're actually uh, in the process of generating, where we are going to expose uh, human volunteers to other strains uh, to COVID, uh, then also to other volunteers who've been vaccinated or been uh, naturally infected. Uh, so, uh, people who already have some sort of immunity and virtually all of us um, fall into this category and also to other viruses. And if we then analyze what is uh, different in those who already have immunity and to, to our current uh, data set where volunteers have never been exposed to the virus, um, then we might be able to identify novel ways of inducing protection other than just with vaccines and also help with the developing of novel uh, vaccines for future pandemics. Essentially, we're trying to be better prepared for the uh, next pandemic. Yeah, and that's exactly what we need. Dr. Warlock, wouldn't you say, you know, um, Dr. Nicola was just mentioning now that the tests were done on one variant. Are you looking forward to then testing on the other variants as well? Uh, yeah, I think it would be really interesting. So we obviously know um, through, you know, seeing what's happening in the general public, but also from a number of other scientists that are looking into these sort of studies, that they do respond, our body responds in very different ways to certain variants. Some of them are much better at sort of evading our immune responses. And so I think it would be really interesting and, and provide a lot of helpful information to compare to, to what's happening in, in these new strains. Well, it's very exciting studies that you're conducting there and I wish you all the best. Looking forward to hearing more from the rest of your studies that have been done as well. Thank you so much for joining us.